beautiful to look around this room and see black folks and white folks and Asian folks and Hispanic folks because, you know, more than, more than anything, y'all read my JPay messages, this is still a melting pot. It's a melting pot. And it takes all of us together to make this country a better place. It's going to take all of us together to make this institution a better place. But I'm not going to keep you any, any longer. We're going to go ahead and bring up our speaker. Our speaker today, Dr. Julius Bailey, teaches philosophy, philosophy and African American studies at Wittenberg University in Springfield. He is a philosopher, culture, cultural critic, social theorist, and diversity lecturer. Dr. Bailey has been a guest on numerous media outlets and often sought, sought to speak at colleges, prisons, churches, and community organizations across America. He, said he has authored four books, including the award-winning Racial Realities and Post-Racial Dreams, The Age of Obama and Beyond, and edited two other notably, uh, two others, notably the widely circulated The Cultural Impact of Kanye West. His new book will be released in February, and this is, this is it. Racism, Hypocrisy, and Bad Face, A Moral Challenge to, America, to the America I Love. He is currently the director of pre-law and justice and law and public policy at Wittenberg University. Let's give a big hand to Dr. Julius Bailey. First of all, I just want to say wow, right? Wow. Like, when I say wow, what I mean by that is that um, this is my third year that um, I've been invited to, uh, a third year in a row, that I've been invited to engage with you brothers. And um, the first year, you know, I had a decent crowd. Second year, it dwindled a little bit. But I just asked the warden, I said, was, is there a giveaway up in here today? You know what I'm saying? Because I got a, such a big audience. And um, he said, no, 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 folk just wanted to be here. And so I thank all of you for uh, being here. Obviously, we have various schools and education wings and stuff like that. And so, hey, how you doing? So I'm going to be cognizant to your time. I'm going to pay attention to your energy. Uh, I'm going to ask you to help me as I deliver whatever it is that God has on my heart today. Uh, and we're going to move, move, move through with this in about, you know, an hour for 45 minutes or so. Uh, I, I, am, I am a professor, and so... Uh, I'm going to allow, if maybe, the crowd is kind of large, but I may allow a couple questions. We'll see what the warden says at the end. Um, but uh, the time is just, I don't know, you know, if he it says it's cool, uh, let's, let's just do it. Uh, that's cool with you? Okay, that's cool with you. I do have to teach at 3.30, so I do got to get out of here at least by 3, but uh, we're going to make it happen. Um, those of you who are praying persuasion, I just ask you for, just for one minute. If you're not, it's okay. For one minute, if you just close your eyes and, and, and center yourself to the God that you serve and just ask God to be in your heart at this moment, to ask God to speak to your heart, to speak to your mind, to release all negative energies, to clear up all that which may come in the way of whatever God's servant has to offer in this moment, I ask you to deep dig, I mean, dig deeply and ask the God that you represent. Ask God to be a vessel to continue the work that God has in your life. I ask you right in this moment to ask yourself, what is my name? The song that came on when we first got here was, you know, my name. And, and Brother Blackwell says, we have the power to name ourselves. And so right now we just ask our God to help us to name ourselves after you. God, we are your children. We are not children of the world. We are children of your spirit. And in this moment, we ask that all hearts are clear and all minds are pure as I do what God say that I do at this moment. For all Fast forward to the story. The point is that I've developed 20 years of an addiction. Not just fun. It started off as fun. Until junior year of football, my 
expense money for food began to go to the strip clubs in the cities that we visited. Senior year, I ate where I could eat, no problem, whatever. I eat that, but then our little, uh, our little per diem money, I cast it out and went to whatever club I went to give my little money to Strawberry Moet and Rain and them. And then I began to go to graduate school. In graduate school, I took out loans. I got full tuition scholarships to Harvard full tuition scholarships to University of Illinois. And here I took out loans for 10, 12, 15,000 so that I can have enough money to go to the club. I just wanted to seek in with you for a minute. This is addictive behavior. I didn't call it that. I'm just kicking it with my homie. But then I start remembering that, 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 that every relationship I was in, I started looking at them the way I looked at Coco and Strawberry in them. And so I asked my girlfriend, you cute and all, but can you twerk? You nice, you sweet, you cook a good greens and cornbread, but can you drop down and get your ego on, girl? And, 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 and over this period of time, I was unbeknownst to myself. Over this period of time, I began to, 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 to affect and infect the way in which I engaged with women. Now, I'm going to be real with you. I was never one, one of those brothers that call women bees and hoes. And I, I was never one of those guys. And I used to brag about that until I realized that I still treated women like bees and hoes, even though I didn't use the term. Self-reflection, realizing that you ain't no better than him because you don't use the word if, in fact, you're still treating them in that way. And so over the years, brothers, see, I'm, I'm getting to this point of this story. Over the years, I started realizing that my comfort zone was in this particular mess. I waited for my week to get to Thursday night. That's the only night I went to the club on Thursday nights because, you know, Monday night and Tuesday nights, I always had the old ladies in there, you know what I'm saying? Grandma stripper, you know what I'm saying? And they didn't do nothing for your boy, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and then, and then and later in the week, you know, I ain't going to lie to you, some of y'all was there. I see, I, yeah, I remember you, yeah. Some of y'all was there. And some of y'all was a bit younger, and some of y'all had a little more money, and some of y'all was a bit, and I was like, no, nah, I need to leave before the younger crowd get in. And so over the years, I began to make Thursdays my holiday. Then I moved to Ohio in 2009. And I went to a place that now shut down called the Harem. I hope y'all laughing because of the name and not that y'all been there before. <laughs> so went to the Harem and I'm walking around the Harem and the Harem was something like uh, different than some of the regular clubs. The harem had tall poles and lights, and it was people. Everybody was like this was like a, a this was like a real club, not like the hole in the wall with you know. I'm like, man. But then I, I'm be honest with you, brothers. I started asking the question. You know, really, I like rain. I like them. They ain't, they ain't got enough sisters in the room for me. He said, you got a place with a little more sisters with some people with some more junk in the trunk? He said, it's this black place. Go there. So I go to the black place. I've got the name of it now, but I ain't going to tell you because y'all might tell me don't even say it because we, that was the old us. We don't do that no more. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that it's closed down. But I start going there and then I'm cool. One day, I'm there. This is 2011. This is the next to the last time that I've gone to a strip club. I'm sitting there chilling, drinking. Of course, I've got to tell you, my name is Andre in the club, right? So I'm sitting there, and a sister comes over to me and says, hey, you want to dance? I'm like, well, I'm sipping on my yak right now. You know, at some point I might be able to, you know, but right now I just have a seat. and buy you a drink. Let's get to know each other. Because remember, again, I want to know who she is. I'm a different kind of patron, you know. 
And so after a few minutes, she heard me stutter. And she said, have I met you before? So, you know, in, in good Chicago, cool fashion, I'm like, probably in your dreams, baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and, and she said, but no, I, I, I've, I've met you before. I was like, no, nah, I don't know. My name is Andre. She, said, she go on stage. She come back about a half hour, 40 minutes later. She has a book in her hand. Not as big as that, but just like a little notebook, hardcover notebook. She opens it up. She says, Dr. Julius Bailey, February 11th, 2010. I will not be defined by my circumstance. She said, that's you. So now, right, I'm like that. Like, oh, no, 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 no. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. You know what I'm saying? No. Right? She says, that was, she said, you spoke, my mom is a college professor, and you spoke at her college, and I went to this event, and you spoke, and I wrote this down, because I never forgot that, because I was going through some stuff, and my, 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 my baby daddy, was, she said, that's you. So at this point now, I'm like, well, I mean, I'm exposed, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm out here like, like old Jesse Smollett, you know what I'm saying? What do I do now? <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry about that, y'all. <laughs> but look, she says, why are you in a place like this? Now, my mind, I'm thinking, I've been in places like this for 20 years, baby. Like, this is what I do. And she says to me, she says, you are bigger than this content. Again, my flip, my, my, my immediate flip was, well, if I'm bigger, so are you. What are you doing here? Right? But I didn't go there because, again, she's talking about me. Because too many times we, we, we brothers, we flip the script on the sisters when they're really just trying to get us to see ourselves. And we want to get mad at them because now they put a mirror in ourselves so that we have to see who we are. We got one clap for the... I got one amen in the room. <laughs> Say it one more time for the people in the back. I got you. So listen, let me close this part up and move forward. So in that moment, she says, let me show you something else. And she went through that book, and she had a series of poems. And the poems were all poems about not being confined to her context. And she says, Dr. Bailey, you never know how much you have influenced me. She said, no, it doesn't show here, but what you don't know is that actually I graduate this year from college. And when I first met you, I didn't even really know I was going to go to college. She says, well, what you don't know about me is that I actually have a full-time job. I only do this two times a week. What you don't know about this is that I actually have a group of young women who I mentor, and I'm honest about the fact that I do this, trying to help them not to choose this as an option. And she said, Dr. Bailey, I hate to put this to you like this, she says, but are you, were you lying then or are you lying now? And in that moment, I began to think about who I was. And I began to think about whose I was. And I began to realize that every time I dropped a dollar on the floor, I dropped $5 on the stage, every time I found felicity, I found happiness by watching these girls run around like chickens, I realized just how ugly and dirty I was for finding pleasure in watching these sisters fight over dollars. And I asked myself, why am I complicit to the destruction of people who I claim I care about because just yesterday I was trying to uplift lives and today I'm in the process of destroying lives 
So either I lied yesterday when I say you can be anything that you want to be, or I'm lying today realizing you ain't nothing but a stripper. And then she told me, whichever one it is, Dr. Bailey, all I know is you can't be both. And I said that was the next to the last time. Let me tell you the last time. How you doing, brothers? I thank you all for being here. The last time I went, actually, I was under the, it had been about six months. Because, again, I gave it up. I'm done. Cold turkey. My friends was like, I'm getting married. I just want to go one time. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I'm like, cool. I witnessed a fight. For the first time in 20 years, I'd never seen a fight in a strip club. And I witnessed a fight. And my friends, one of which who were in the fight, a rapper, a local rapper, one of which was in the fight, before he went into the locus of the fight, grabbed me, pulled me out the club, said, Jew, stay in the car. He ran back in. And in that moment, he got involved in a fight and an altercation that led him to his death. This is 2012. When I tell you, I never, I've never cried at a man's funeral outside of my granddaddy the way I cried at this 23-year-old young boy's funeral. I cried because this young man who didn't have no PhD, didn't have no JD, didn't have no GED, but he was drawn to me from the time he was 19 to the time he died at 23 because there was something that I had to give. And he was about to give his life to a woman. And he died that night, though. But the last thing he did before he died was to save my life. And brothers, this when I tell you this story, I'm telling you this because that brother who wanted to be at the club, who's 23, who's kicking it, who, yes, had a gun, that young brother saw something more in my life than he even saw in his own life. And knew that for whatever reason, whatever was about to jump off in here, he had to protect this dude named Julius. And brothers, as Brother Blackwell told you earlier, he says, these fellowship moments, there are some of us, and again, I'm, look, I've been doing this a long time. I've met a lot of you over the years. Some of us, we are who we are. We act how we think we need to act to make it. There are real things going on in this institution that we have to protect ourselves from. I get all that. And I can't speak on that because that's your reality. But what do I know? I know that some of you got brothers around you who are trying to speak into your life. And many of you ignore those brothers from speaking into your life. And some of you got brothers around you speaking in your life, and you're looking at them like, you ain't worth nothing. You ain't got nothing. And I'm trying to tell you, that's exactly why he's speaking into your life. Because in that moment, he realizes, I got nothing left for myself. But you got an out date coming up. I ain't got one coming, but I need you to know, brother, that you are bigger than the Ohio Department of Corrections. And, and here's the thing about it is that, again, if, if we're being true to ourselves, some of us ignore the very God in others, in part because we're afraid of the God in ourselves. Sometimes it's too cool to fall on your knees and say, God, I'm sorry. And so because it's too cool, I'm just going to read something I heard about five minutes ago, literally, right before I walked in the door. I was listening to my radio, and there's a Meek Mill song. So it came on, and I was like, man, that was, I'm listening. I'm like, the hook was cool. It had Justin Timberlake in the hook. Interesting. I like Meek Mill, but I really had paid my much into it, you know. So I had to get on my phone real quick. I was, I was, I was a few minutes late getting to the gate because I had to return, you know, replay the song on my YouTube. 
It's a song called Believe by Meek Mill. Let me just quote this just a little bit. This is quick. I just wrote this down. Literally, look. My pad was empty. <laughs> I was coming to you pure in heart. That's it. Then the song came on. I'm just going to read the song. I'm going I'm, I'm to get to some history, some stuff. I'm going to get out of your way in 30 minutes. Follow your dreams, not your addiction. How are we going to follow dreams locked up in prisons? They tried to swallow me whole. God be my witness. They tried to deprive me of my dreams, but I am relentless. My bank account was on super zero, but I did not panic because I'm a superhero. Say I believe in myself. When everyone else stopped believing, don't leave on yourself. That was right before I walked in this door. So when I tell you to close your eyes and open your heart, and just God just spoke that into me. And so as I talk a little history now and flex on my philosophical skills, I want you to stop and put a pencil here. I'm going to say it one more time. Think about it. If you haven't heard it, figure out a way to hear it. Follow your dreams, not your addictions. It took me a long time to admit I was addicted to strippers. It took me a long time to admit that there was something about me that found value in devaluing other people. There was something about me that made me look like or feel like I was a peacock flexing all my colors in context of other chickens. And while they skirting around, throwing out a dollar, I'm just flexing my colors, strutting around clubs across America. Flexing, flexing, until that one woman told me in 2011, why are you happy being a peacock when you can be an eagle? Flexing, you think you're doing something among us chickens over here, but the reality is, is that you may be doing something with the chickens, but you're failing in the eyes of God. Follow your dreams, not your addictions. How are we going to follow dreams locked up in prisons? I don't have to tell y'all about this context. Y'all can speak and preach to me about this context. The one thing I am going to say about this context, which some of you know, some of you may not think because you're locked into it, you did an objective perspective, but some of you realize that let's put it this way. I'm not speaking about these good brothers, but there are many people in the state of Ohio that would prefer y'all stay here then leave here. There are many people in the state of Ohio that would prefer y'all in your out date. They gonna say, I leave the light on for you, bruh. I see you when you get back. We gonna be here. See you when you get back. And when we are not thinking about this system as a system that doesn't fully, I say fully because there are some things we can learn from being in this context, and I'm not here to talk about the goodness of prisons at all. What I'm here to say, though, there are times in which God shuts us down in order to build us up. That's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm sure y'all wish I wish he had shut me down at the crib. <laughs> right, right, right. He could have shut me down <laughs> At somebody's club. He ain't had to choose the ODRC. Like, come on, bro. But for some of us, this was the path. This was it. For some of us who didn't face our addictions, I know that some of you who are working through your addictions. And in the moment of addiction, of course, you don't see yourself as an addict. So whatever it is. Some of us, like we, 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 we do anything for clout. Addicted to that. Let alone the drugs and the alcohol and stuff that some of us suffer from. Meek Mill says, don't let prison be inside of you. Uh, the brother there, in the, what's your name again, brother? 
KC told me, he said, Dr. Bailey, when he seen me, he gave me a big hug. He said, Dr. Bailey, you know one thing I remember you said to me before? He said, you may wear the state's blues, but don't let the blues wear you. Think, think about that. Historically, let me get, get historical real quick. Historically, the blues was a transformational music, right? We think of the blues as my baby didn't love me, right? I ain't got no money. My mama don't love me. But in these contexts, in these songs, they're trying to, here's a word for you, in these contexts, in these songs, they're trying to hold on to an existential reality. Somebody repeat, existential reality. An existential reality is, what is the realness of my existence? How do I see myself in the context? And I need to speak truth about my context. But in order for me to overcome my context, I have to speak truth to my context. And so in reality, if I don't see myself as an addict, if I don't see myself as a thug, if I don't see myself as a violent man, if I don't see myself as a, whatever it is that I've been going through, then I am not going to overcome those things. Because many of us within our addictions and even outside our addictions, many of us see ourselves as perpetual victims. For all, for all, for all, for all my 35 to 45 year old ears, oh, it ain't my fault. It ain't my fault. <laughs> right? The young folks don't know about that because it ain't the Migos. So they like. We don't, some of us don't take ownership in it. I got to take ownership in our addiction because the prisons that ODRCI lines up with, the way they make their money, the way they employ good brothers and good sisters, the way they do those kind of things is because there are choices and decisions that are made across America. And there are institutions like the justice institutions who take advantage of decisions that are made across America. And quite frankly, we don't have time to get into sociology uh, and, 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 and political science, but there are also institutions and structures that put things in place that, 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 that makes it even more harder for brothers and sisters and poor folk and single folk. I ain't I, 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 I going to do this. Let me do this real quick. So last week, our president stood up at the State of the Union. And he says to America, this is, the most, uh, this is the best time in America's history. Our, our economy is up. Our joblessness is up. And we need to be excited. And everybody stood up and started clapping. Not everybody, but all the clapping. And I sat there. I was in a hotel room, but I was in Youngstown, Ohio. And I sat there, and I listened to him, and I said, so it may be the case. Oh, what's your name, brother? Hakeem, it may be a case that, not you specifically, but Hakeem got a job and is on, the, on somebody's payroll. And let's just say Hakeem got a decent job at Walmart for $13, $14 an hour. But what you don't know is that Hakeem's boss don't let Hakeem work more than 25 hours a week. And there's very few full-time employees working in that building. What we don't know in the president's speech is that take that across America. Some of you, some of you got children's mothers. Some of you got, got cousins and brothers who work at McDonald's and Dairy Queen and, 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 and the grocery stores and all these places. They got a job. And our president was right. You're working. But, but Mr. President, sir, let's, I'm not a math major, but Let's do some quick math. The national poverty rate is $25,000 a year. In order to make $25,000 a year, I have to make a little bit over $2,000 a month. In order to make a little bit over $2,000 a month, I have to make about 500, a little over $500 a week. In order for me to make $500 a week at 10, 11, $12 an hour, I have to work 50 hours a week, sir. And I don't have a job to let me work 50 hours a week, sir. And even when I get a second job, y'all say, you know what? My hustle game is strong. So you get a second job. 20 hours here, 22 hours there. Now you're working those weeks, and now you get a phone call that says, oh, oh remember that tenant you asked for? Or remember those food stamps you asked for when you were just working 20 hours? 
Now we're just going to take that from you, young buddy. Because <laughs> you're working 40-something hours. You don't need the food stamps. You're thinking, I got four kids, three kids. You're thinking, okay, wait a minute, okay. So you call your baby mama, you call your ex. You say, baby mama, ex, you know. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying. I, 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 I know I missed the payment, but I'm trying. You know, I get this, I get this. I say, but you don't understand. I'm working, I'm trying. And baby mama, luckily, you, 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 you might get lucky. Maybe I'm, I'll work with you. I'll go get a job. So now, baby mama working, you working. Between the three of y'all, y'all working 60 hours a week and still under poverty. Because baby mama got child care support services that says she has to work a certain number of hours to be able to get the child care support services. But then you can't work too many hours because you won't get the services, and you can't work too little hours because you won't get the services. And so now baby mama trying to navigate that, and as soon as she say, oh, well, they, 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 they let me work some, some, some extra hours, can you take care of little buddy? You're like, well, I got to go work the other job. And baby mama said, no, 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 you can't. You got to come home and take care of little buddy. And now you're getting mad because the weight of the world is on you as a man. And you're saying, I got to take care of my children. And baby mama said, you got to take care of your children. And you said, I can't afford to not to. But then your baby mama say, you can't, I can't afford to go to work. And then we hear the claps. I was in Youngstown, Ohio, like I said. The next line, he says that, Stock prices are up to the highest degree in America's history. And I'm sitting there in Youngstown, Ohio, where the median income is 34000 Where poverty rate ain't changed, it's still 25000 so I go to a speech with young town health professionals, doctors and nurses and all of them, and I know some of them like Trump, so I'm telling them, you know, you know, let's talk about Pelosi and them. They got some problems, you know, to make sure I get out of town, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just like, you know, let's talk about, let's talk about these Democrats. They got their own problems, you know what I'm saying? But in the course of the conversation, I'm like, you know, Trump, Trump got a point. Stock prices are high. I said, that's exciting for all those who got stuck. And so I looked around the room. I said, some of y'all got stuck, but how many of your patients do here in Youngstown? How many of your caseload are people who have invested in the stock market? Now the claps got softer. I said, don't, don't, don't stop clapping, Youngstown professionals, because the stock market is at the highest point that has ever been. Be proud of yourself while at the same time the very people you work for on a daily basis can't afford a bottle of milk. I'm not here to be political. What I'm here to tell you is that we have to be carefully thinking people, strategically thinking people. And when we're under sickness, we got something to fall back on. But now we're in a process of healing. No matter how you call this oppressive system, this, at this moment, this is our healing time. And some of us are becoming clean. Some of us have been clean. And we now have to figure out what's going to happen at my release date. I need to go back into an America that sees all of you as a reentry, a likely reentry. And you're saying, I don't want to drink no more. I don't want to smoke no more. I don't want to hit, hit my children no more. I don't want to be abusive to my wife no more. I want to be productive. I am a man. I'm a better man. This place has made me a better man. And, you, and you've told yourself this every day, every push-up, every thought process, every basketball hoop. You've told yourself a thousand times. You've heard Bailey and, and Ward and everybody. Else. You've heard these conversations until now you get slapped into reality. And your son is happy to see you, and your daughter's happy to see you. And they say, Dad, Mom, can we go? Uh, Dad, can we go to the grocery store? Can we go to the mall? Dad, can we do this? Dad, can you buy me this again? And you're thinking about this. Hold on, man, I ain't got no job. And what they're saying, I just want my daddy. And the pressure's on you now. I'm sorry, are you all right? 
The pressure's on you now because you're like, I ain't got it, baby. And baby is like, I just want you, daddy. Can let's do this. Can we go to the mall? Can we go to the movies? And you're thinking, I ain't got no money. And every mantra, every saying that Bailey and DiCarlo and Robinson, every conversation is now going to be running to your head. And now, this is where we're going to have to reach into the annals of history. Black, white, brown. What do we do when our backs are against the wall? What do we do under contexts that are oppressive? And every time I try to leave, something keeps pulling me back. Every time you try to escape the very thing that got you in this context, something is going to pull at you. Why? Because there are systems and structures, first of all, principalities and things in high places, first of all. But there's also re material realities like baby diapers and like baby mama and like grandmama that's going to be pulling at you too. And then you're going to think, why is it that everybody's clapping in an America that has forgotten you? And so that's why people like me, I, I'm, not proud of, I'm not saying this is to, be, to boast myself, but that's why people like me don't get excited when I sit down with corrections officers. I mean, not officers, when I sit down with corrections leaders and I sit down with folks and say, well, our incarceration rate has plummeted. We're, 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 we're incarcerating less numbers of people. My first question always, how many are you employing? What job programs are you creating such that they have a, a, a transition into freedom? What kind of resources is the state putting forth toward to avoid reentry? Even our president spoke to the fact that his federal, uh, and, and, and God bless him, I think it's something, I, I, I think it's real. And I appreciate this, 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 this one of few things that the president's administration has done. He said, look, we're going to be about the business of sort of reducing incarceration on the federal level when it comes to drug sales. Right? He did that last year. Right? Worked with Jared Trump, his brother-in-law, I mean his son-in-law. Work with other leaders across America and created this new federal peace, right? And so, at one level, we give him love. On a flip level, we're still trying to ask him, where are the resources that dismantle structures that created who we were the first time? I got the prayers. I got the mantras. I need the job. I need the education. I need the Self-building. I need to be able to know. What's your name, brother? I need to know that Britain and Hakeem can work together. So are we working together in these institutions? Or are we structured to leave them isolated and only bring them together playing basketball? Or only bring them together at, at, at Bailey's talk? Because now Britain and Hakeem is going to be out, and they haven't built bonds of relationship with each other. And last week, two weeks ago, when our brother Kobe died, and the black men on my campus were hearing from women, I don't know how y'all are all so sad about Kobe. You know he raped that girl. And I, and I gave voice to the sisters. I said, you know what? There was a case. He set it out of court. He, he had publicly admitted what he did wrong. I said, but why are you denying these brothers hurt? Why are you not allowing them to wrestle with the person, for many of these young brothers, the person who were the reason they kept going before they kept going, the reason they kept pushing when they thought they were getting, the reason they didn't think about excellence. Like, Bill, you got a point, but I'm just saying, like, you know, men are always acting like they just, they just going to be absolved of their responsibility. I said, that's not Kobe. I don't know what conversation you have in, but Kobe owned up to it in that moment, owned up to it years after, owned up to it to his wife, owned up to it to that woman, owned up to it to the nation. What y'all really want from a... Yeah. 
What more can I do? Some of you are going to be hampered. Here's back to Blackwell's point. We got to work now. We're going to close this up. You got to be hampered by these blues. We work on the outside. We're working on ban the box stuff. We're working on things like that because you're going to be hampered by it. They're going to say, are you a convicted felon? Before they basically even know your name. You got to ask yourself, should I lie? Should I tell the truth? Some of you say, but I tell the truth, I definitely ain't going to get the job. Some of you say, if I lie and they found out I ain't going to get the job. If I lie, it goes against every mantra that the warden said, because every mantra that the colonel said, every mantra that the ch- ch- chaplain said, everything that I've tried to own up to myself and my transgressions, now you're asking me to check a box that then will determine whether or not I can feed my child. Brothers, the gift and the curse of my conversation to you is that I have no answers to the problems that exist once you're free. But what I do have is a prescription of how to deal with freedom when you can be free in a year. I'll repeat that. I don't have any answers. Trust me, if I had Jeff Bezos' money, I think I told y'all last year when Jeff Bezos was getting divorced with his wife, I told you I was trying to holler at his wife. You know what I'm saying? I tried. I sent, I sent her an email. I, I unbuttoned his shirt. I sent her a picture. You know what I'm saying? I would like Jeff Bezos' wife, Miss Bezos. You, 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 you got like 500 million. Maybe even more. Don't you want to holler at your boy? You know what I'm saying? (laughs) So if I had Jeff Bezos money or Mrs. Jeff Bezos money, I would employ all y'all, but I ain't got it. And I'm not going to sit. I've been doing this too long with y'all. I talk to you after you get out. I talk to your families and stuff. I'm not going to lie to you and say it's all going to be good when you get out. What I have to promise you is that I'm working in my context and with my groups of people to make sure that structures and laws are in place that makes it a little bit easier or a little less stressful. I ain't got no answers. I just got questions. And the question I have, are you ready to be free? See, freedom isn't just a mandate Remember, historically, remember, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed before the 13th Amendment was enacted. There was a document that said you were free before you were actually free. If you don't believe me, you don't have to believe me, just understand me. The Emancipation Proclamation predated the 13th Amendment. If the 13th Amendment wouldn't have come back and buttressed and held strong the fact that these ex-slaves are now free people, the document just would have been just blank and empty and something that Lincoln signed to make sure Negroes helped us fight. That's what it was about, right? We ain't, I know there's nobody in this room that think that Lincoln loved black folk. I hope that that's if not, y'all need to invite me to another day for the education class. Lincoln was the man that said, I can give a damn about these Negroes, but I have political expediency in my face. If I had it my way, I'd ship them all to Haiti, he said. But I'm looking at a political climate that I can use these brothers to gain access to the Union. I mean, to gain access to the Confederacy. What is it like, brothers, to constantly have your body used? It didn't just start in the ODRC. It started in in, in the 1400s in Europe. It moved into this context in 1618. Your body has always been fodder for people to use. And 
we think about what it means to be a Denmark VC or Gabriel Prosser or a Nat Turner or Harriet Tubman. And we, we think about those people and we wonder, why don't we elevate them in school? We want to talk about King, but let's talk about more of these people that said, I will be dang on if I'm a slave one more day. Some of you in this moment got to create your own internal, internal, not political, your own internal resistance model. Your name has to be your name. Your name cannot be inmate in the ODRC with which a number. Brothers of all races and all ages in this group one thing we do have in common outside of our racial differences, we all have an upward battle. And we have an upward battle that we must fight because the only recourse is for five years from now, if whoever follows these brothers, if they're not here, and they call me, Bailey, what you doing? I'll be in here again. I don't want to see you if you had a release date. I don't want to see you here again. I want to see you at Speedway. Let's go get some coffee. <laughs> Happens all the time. I'm a, I'm a public dude. You go outside right now, Google me, you find anything about me. Just let me wrap up with this. What we know about history is that, especially when it comes to people on the backside of power, Poor women, children, racially minoritized folk. And as the years go forward, same gendered loving folk, all these folk get put on the backside of power. And now laws become enacted and conversations become made. What do we do with these people? I tell you to go back and get your souls a black folk book, small book, put in your pocket. When, when Du Bois says, how does it feel to be a problem? Brothers, the world sees you as a problem. Hopefully not many, but some of you see yourselves as a problem. But one thing I know Meek Mill told us is that they, the ODRC, tried to swallow me whole. But to God be my witness, they tried to deprive me of my dreams, but I am relentless. This isn't Bailey talking. This is Meek Mill talking. They're still going bad on the many ways. That, that guy. They, 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 my mama, they, my baby mama, they, my school system, they, my state uh, 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 police department, they, ODRC, they tried to swallow me. They, my brother, they, my mother, they, maybe even yourself, tried to swallow me whole. But to God be my witness. I'm not going to let them dry, deprive me of my dreams. I am relentless. Brothers, we have to have a relentless spirit, a push spirit, pushing through, pushing through, pushing through, even as they fight back, even as they pull you back, pushing through. Why? Because Meek Mill said it here. I believe in myself. When everyone else stopped believing, don't you leave. There's nothing that I can say today that would help you to be a better you until you believe in yourself. Trust me, I can quote your books. I can tell you historical facts and all that kind of stuff. I do it every day to my students. But what I don't get a chance to do with my students is speak to their hearts. Because they act like they got it going on because they're paying $40,000 a year to go to college. 
until they realize that life hits them too. But in this moment, you all afford me and this huge audience, you all afford me the opportunity to speak to your heart. Now, I know. I had a couple hundred folk in this room or whatever. So some of y'all bored, some of y'all ready to go. But I want you to be bold enough to believe in yourself. Be bold enough not to let anything or anyone stop you from being the best that you can be at that which you need to be. Because the history of this country whether we, we begin in America in 1619, or whether we talk about the Caribbean and Brazil and Peru and from the 1440s. Because y'all do know, just as a side, I don't want to lose this moment. You all do know that slavery existed before the colonies, right? And you all do know that most black slaves in the world in this transatlantic movement didn't find their way to America, right? right? So we think about when you wonder why everybody going to Carabana and everybody hanging out with the Africans or hanging out with the Caribbeans. You, you wonder when you go on the cruise and you go to Bahamas and you go to Jamaica and you, hey, everybody look like me. It's a chapel, but no joke. <laughs> Because that brother who we celebrate, who some of y'all celebrate because I don't, that Christopher Columbus dude, hmm? right? the agent of Imperial Spain, who found his way into the Americas, specifically a Dominican Republic and Haiti area, who began the process of letting the Imperial Crown know it's some indigenous folk here that we can conquest and take their stuff and have them work for us and build our stuff. And the Queen Isabella say, for real? Well, forget about that one. Let me build you some Ninas and some Pinsas and some Santa Marias. Let me get you all the ships that you need. Go bring me all the daggone savages. And then, just the way the game works, y'all know the game. Y'all see Spain coming up. Y'all figure, y'all trying to peep the game. Spain, how you coming up? They say in my neighborhood of Chicago, cut me in or cut that out. You know what I'm saying? So Denmark said, Spain, what you doing? Spain said, man, I got this new hookup. It's called Africa. We can move them and transport them into these spaces that I've already conquested by killing the indigenous folk. You want in on this Denmark? Denmark's like, yeah. France, what was going on? Denmark, I heard you involved in something. Spain, you, I see the crown getting bigger. France say, can I get down? Spain and Denmark say, yo, we got a big continent of Africans. And, and, you, and you got our back and our militarization, and our ships to help you gain access to them. All this happened for 200-something years before they even thought about Jamestown, Virginia. And so when you go to South America, and you go to the Caribbean, you see all these people that look like me speaking various languages, French, French British colonies, Spanish-speaking folk. Y'all trying to figure out how all these black people start speaking all these languages. And it's probably because your school in Ohio, Detroit, didn't teach y'all. That these slaves didn't just start in Mississippi somewhere. As a matter of fact, 
the, the great Toni Morrison says, there may have been 100 million that may have died even before we even started this game here in America. My mentor, I'm, I'm going off, off script, but my mentor told me. Well, if you know me, my mentor is Cornell Weston. When I was getting married, he came to my wedding, and I told him, look, I, I, I want you to, you're going to come to our reception. We, I mean, you could come to our honeymoon with us. So we y'all going on the honeymoon. So we're going to the Dominican Republic, kick it. So how y'all getting there? We're taking a cruise. We're kicking it, cruise, drinking, turn up. Cornell looked at me. He said, brother, I can't go on no cruise. I said, I'll pay for it, Doc. Look at all you've done for me. Like, he said, it's not it. He said, you expect me to go on the Royal Caribbean and turn up in the same Atlantic Ocean that hundreds of Africans jumped off the boat. Hundreds of millions of Africans, that tens of millions of Africans were thrown off the boat. And you want me to kick it on the waters that inhabit the blood and bones of our ancestors? Now, at that point, I'm like, Cornell, you're too damn deep, man. I, I'm like, I'm like, man, I'm, I just saw the commercial, you know what I'm saying? I get unlimited drinks for $35, like. So I thought about it, told my fiance, baby, we need to think about something. I'm like, what's up? Tell her. She's like, Julius, that's deep. But you know we're still going, right? <laughs> and I'm like, hell yeah, turn up. Turn up. But look, here's my point. Countries, institutions, nations have been built on the backs of us. And some of us, even in 2020, are building nations for folk. As big as Europe, as small as Jeff Bezos. Even though he ain't even small. We're building. We, we, we building. Again, this is no indictment. This is what it is. We're in the system. We made some choices. We got caught. So some of us may be innocent, but we're in a situation. We found ourselves in. And some of us are involved. Some of us make desks, make chairs, make beds. We make all these things so somebody else can get rich. And when you get out next week, next month, next year, two years, you're going to be trying to figure out how can I get a bed? How can I get a desk? And the, and the answer is going to be, you, you know how to make one now. So make one. And you're going to think of all the desks and beds that you made for somebody to profit. It's not your mama. It's not your children. It's not you. So we can't change the past, gentlemen. There's nothing we can do about whatever happened in that moment or moments. But our freedom begins now. Our release therapy, as Ludacris says, begins now. So I ask you, please stand with me. I ask you, please stand with me, please. I ask you. Stretch it out for the next three minutes. I'll let you go. So I ask you in this moment, are you, is this your dream? I'm asking you. It's not your dream, right? And so we had dreams. Don't let this system destroy your dream. Make this moment an incubation moment. Make the plan. I'm thinking of a master plan. Go back to the old school hip hop. Rakim told you. I'm not going to rob no more because now I've learned to earn. 
because I'm righteous. You know the song. Brothers, we have to dream bigger. We have to want freedom in ourselves. So in the spirit of my brother Jay-Z, just repeat this for me. This can't be life. This can't be love. This can't be right. It got to be more. This can't be us. One more time. This can't be life. This can't be love. This can't be right. It got to be more. This can't be me. Brothers, if you don't take anything else away from this conversation, just know these state blues on that release date, I wouldn't buy another damn thing blue <laughs> ever. That's just me. But some of y'all rocking the blues stuff, though. I ain't got time to get into that, but I seen y'all when you walked in and you got the swag in them blues. And I'm thinking to myself, it's, I ain't going to tell you what I'm thinking to myself, but I'm wondering, are these blues wearing you? And in this moment, you have to realize that I'm in this condition in this moment. But the blues is not who I am. And so, brothers, on this day, the 12th of February, 2020, as the word says, choose day. And I'm not here to tell you what to do. I can't even tell you how to do that which you're going to do because everybody got a different dream. But what I am going to tell you that there's a serious choice. You can be free of this place or, or, or this place will welcome you back home. And you just told me that this can't be life. You just told me that. And so if this can't be life, then whatever it takes when you're on the outside, Strip the blues, it, I, I, I got to do it. Strip some friends, I love you, bro. You my dog, you my homie from the beginning, but I need to change my context. As hard as it might be, sometimes it's our mamas. Because sometimes we got mothers. Look, you're going to have to be a man. You got to go out there and do it one way or another. And you're going to think, well, mama, I can't do it that way again. So real quickly, bow your head real quickly. I, I'm sorry to hold you. I keep on talking. I'm fired up. Now I'm ready to talk. Whoever you are, however God that you bring into your heart, just bring them to right now. Dear God, we just ask you to be with us in this moment. We ask you to allow that spirit that has pushed all our ancestors throughout history. Allow that spirit to move in us. Allow us not to let oppressive systems overtake the structure that is the God in me. In this moment, God, I just ask you to bless my family. Soften their hearts to let them know that I am in the process of becoming. I am not who I used to be, and I am not what I'm going to be, but I'm in a process now. Help them to see that. Help my son, help my daughter, help my children to know that I love them. And I may not be there physically, but every decision that I make, every breath that I continue to take will be to be a better father when I get out of here. And God, on this moment, if February 12th, 2020 is my last moment, God, know that I love you. Know that I'm sorry for all that I've done, criminal, uncriminal. I'm sorry for that which I've done to offend anyone because I know the God in me, the good, the pure, 
the trustworthy, the honest, is bigger than the world. And so today I choose you. Today I choose to walk one with the God that I serve. Today, in this moment, at this time, I choose to, to make every decision that I make thinking about what would my God want me to do? Because right now is release therapy. And for whoever you call this God, I ask all the brothers in the room just to say amen. Brothers, I thank you for your time. Brothers, I realize that these aren't easy times, but, but I realize that the God in you is bigger than even what people say about you. But you have to believe that in yourself. But when you get out, Julius Bailey is easy to find. Let's go have some fun, get a drink, if you're not of Kool-Aid, of course. Eat some food, fellowship on the future that you're about to share. I thank you for allowing me another opportunity uh, to share into your lives and your hearts.